course, we want to welcome those that are joining from some one of our campuses, maybe one of the 13 correctional facilities here in Austin, or however you're watching, we're glad that you're online. Celebration Church, can we just say hello? Come on, give them a round of applause. Good to see you guys. And um, yeah, I'm not against the eclipse. I'm, I'm all for it. It's awesome. Let's move on. Next. I want to encourage you to be a part of our marriage master class. We normally have our conference in February, but with other things going on at that time, we're, we're unable to do that. So Lori and I are going to get together with other staff, and we're going to be doing some, uh, just, we'll do a, a panel, and we're going to do some teaching. But from 5 o'clock till 6.30, you can use the QR code on the screen or in the seat back in front of you. But join us next Sunday night. Nothing is happening next Sunday night at 5 o'clock to 6.30. You'll be in time to get home to watch if you watch American Idol. If that's your drug of choice, we'll get you back to the house for that. But if you're married, you need to be here. You need to be a part of what is a simple, just a, it's going to be a good tune-up. It's going to be a good opportunity for us to all connect and meet new people. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you there. And uh, it's free. Come on, say the word free. How many know that's free? That's, that's free. Here's the good news. We had 19,565 people in our services last weekend. Can we just thank God for that? And... Um, it's just super, it's just great, which our area is growing, but our church is continuing to grow. We had 2,168 children in kids' ministry. Y'all, keep doing it. Just keep whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Picking up kids, stealing kids, robbing kids, but I, I want to give a shout out. We had a thousand, just under 1,100 dream teamers, which are all, of course, taking care of us, and the heroes of Easter and the heroes of every weekend are those who serve on the dream team. Can we just thank God for every one of our dream teamers? Um, when you get to heaven, guys, you're not going to see the preachers up there. You're not going to see the, the people that you're used to following, the influencers, the TikTokers. It's going to be those that served when no one recognized them or those that laid down their life for other people. And uh, just like Scott Poole's doing right now, he's just helping this young lady have a seat. Good job, Scott Poole. Give it up for Scott Poole, the dream teamer right there. Look at him. Just working. He's just working. Let's just watch Scott walk out. <laughs> Let me tell you about that guy. He came to our church, and um, we were in a little office behind the Wingate Hotel on 79. And he had a friend that started to come to our church, and at that time he was a sprint dealer. He was... Uh, not a Coke dealer, but a Sprint. He was a, into the phones and had locations all over Texas. And uh, he stopped by. I don't know if he was trying to sell me phones. He stopped into our service or into our, actually our office. He goes, I want to know about this Jesus. Well, fast forward. His wife is sitting here. His one daughter is sitting here. The other daughter is probably serving somewhere. And from that day on, don't come to my office unless you want to be a part of Celebration Church. So uh, now he's serving. It's a, that's, that's what makes the church go. And that's that's frankly what's going to bring you into the life of Celebration Church. You're not going to like the church, or you're going to be okay with church until you start making a difference in the church. That's just the reality. You're not going to like your yard until you start taking care of your yard. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to like anything that you're not investing in. And uh, so with that being said, thank you to all the Dream Team. Italy had a record attendance, nearly 500 in Italy. Come on, let's give it up for our Italy campuses. I know in Liberty Hill, they had just under 1,200 people at the Liberty Hill. And you know we've bought some uh, 15 acres on the corner of 2243 and 183. And we are using this as a great motivating factor to push them out of the school and start building. But they got to start giving in Jesus' name. Don't be looking for the Westinghouse people to give. You all need to make that happen in Liberty Hill. We are um, going to begin a brand new series, and, and, and I'm going to ask this question, and you'll, you're going to see the connection here in just a moment. In fact, let me read the Bible verse to you. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 27. You're going to not realize that this is an Easter scripture. A lazy man does not roast his prey, but the precious possession of a man is diligence. Or translation, a hunter... Or those who hunt, 
they are not just going to go kill what they're hunting, but they're going to roast it. They're going to eat it. They're going to bring it back unless they're lazy. How many hunters do we have in the congregation? Let me see your hand. How many hunters? Confess it. Don't let anybody drive you out of hunting. Confess it. You're a hunter and you're proud of it. Okay. How many fishermen? How many fishermen women do we have? How many enjoy fishing? Now, the reality, what he's saying is, if you're a hunter or if you're a fisherman, you don't just enjoy the kill. It's not about killing. It's about taking that hunt, taking that which you have found in the hunt or that which you have fished out of the lake and bringing it to the table and partaking of the hunt, partaking of the animal, partaking of that fish. I had some catfish last night at Babes. How many like Babes in Dallas? How many have ever been to the Babes in Dallas? You haven't been, you don't know that Babe. It is amazing. And there's this principle that I want to connect to Easter. And then it's going to lead into what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks. What he's saying is, as it relates to Easter, there are people, and here's how I read this scripture. There are people who are into or came to Christ or came to the Easter service or believe that Jesus was killed on the cross. He, He was like the lamb, of course, and he was slaughtered. And they're like, thank you, God, for dying. Thank you for killing yourself or being killed. Thank you for allowing yourself to do what you did for us. Your death, and we thank you for it. Amen, yea, God. The hunter that just boasts in the killing but then doesn't take it to the next phase or the next level, and that is where that which was killed now becomes a part of your life. You bring that home and you taste and you see what you have been a part of. Jesus was killed. He was roasted. But the reality is, is that now our responsibility is to partake, not in the killing side of the cross, but the life side of the cross. How many know it's good to eat what you have killed? How many know that it is not just about taking it out of this world, but now that diligent man doesn't go halfway. Hunting is not just about, or fishing is not just about taking the life of that animal. It is now enjoying the life that was taken. Christ was a life that was taken. And now Jesus does not want us to just say, thank you for dying on the cross. But the Bible says when he after was raised from the dead, before his ascension, in the book of John, verse 22 of chapter 20, the Bible says he goes to his disciples. And what does he do? He, what? Breathes on them. And he says, receive my minty fresh breath. No, he doesn't say that. He says, receive what? The Holy Spirit. Why was Christ crucified? Why was Christ nailed to that tree? Because of our sins. Why was he raised from the dead? To bring us justification, but watch this, but to bring us the power of the Holy Spirit. For the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. Because after the resurrection, after what Christ did for us in his death, in his burial, After he was raised from the dead, he is constantly communicating, not just before the cross, but after the cross to his disciples. Now, the Holy Spirit's job is to take it from here. From now on, watch this, the executor of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. So the whole gospel can be summarized in this way. The Father thought it, the Son spoke it, but it's the Holy Spirit that does it. Watch this. The Father wanted to redeem the world. He wants the world saved. He wants you saved. Redemption. So what did he say? What did he do? He sent his only begotten son, Jesus, the word of God, to declare that the word of God has come, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus accomplishes what he was sent on this planet to do. So the father sent his son, his son coming and being sent, successfully does what he has been sent to do. He goes back to the father, shows him his wounds, sits at the right hand of the throne. And now the father and the son send the spirit, the Holy Spirit. See, the world is redeemed, when you think about the world, when you think about it from this way, from the concept of from the first thought of God, it started with the Father, then it went to the Son, 
and then it's through the Holy Spirit. How many know you don't come to Christ except you are first what? Drawn. So now God in his redemptive economy sends his son. His son goes back. The father and the son send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's work now is to reveal, and this is our series, this is the evidence, to reveal the power and the work of God. And so now as it relates to man, you do not come to the father except through Christ. And you don't come to Christ except you were first drawn. So it goes father, son, Holy Spirit. Going back, it goes Holy Spirit, son, father. And that's what God does. That's how God works. And when he says, guys, now you no longer see me. You no longer have me. You're not going to touch me, but I'm sending to you my spirit. And he, he is going to be the one who is going to finish. In other words, you notice the thought about the prey, thought about the killing, but that's half of what a hunter is supposed to do. That's half of what a fisherman is supposed to do. The final or the fulfillment of God is that you and I would be filled to the fullness and out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Why can you go to some churches? Same Bible. Same verse. Same songs being sung. And you can sit in one atmosphere or in one service of one congregation and wonder if God is even a million miles close to this place. And then you go to another church, same verse, same Bible, same songs, and it is though there is an atmosphere that is alive and contagious. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk to you today, and I'm going to talk to you over these next several weeks, because the Bible tells us, Paul writes to the church in Rome, and he's writing about the Holy Spirit. He says there's a longing of the creation. In creation, there's a longing, verse 19, and the creation is anxiously longing and eagerly desiring the revealing of what? What what does creation want to see? Read those words with me. For the revealing of the sons of God. What is Paul talking about? That there is in this world, creation is groaning, longing, For those that he says are the sons of God. Why? Creation knows that it's broken. Your world, and I don't know if you know this, that you live in and everyone in it is broken. And there is a cry since the fall of humanity, since the fall of this world. Creation is longing for someone who has an answer. How many have realized that government has not been very successful in this creation. Let me see your hand. How many believe that government is broken? And it's like, if you wanted to put it in that context, it's like the world or nations are crying out. Is there a government? Is there a way that can bring life back to our broken world? But it's deeper than that. It's not just nations. It's creation groaning and longing for, notice who has the answer, the sons of God, the daughters of God, what basically creation is crying out for are for people who have the answer to what is the meaning of life. What is the meaning of this world? Why are we on this planet? And creation is frustrated. And I think that there are people in this room, people that are watching, you're frustrated. You're wondering what is the meaning of life? It's why you're finding even in Europe, I read this week, where they are going to give suicide assistance to even people under the age of 18 who don't like their world. Helping those that are still under the age of 18 to kill themselves who don't like life. That is what I'm talking about. What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? Why stay on this world? Why stay on this planet? Take me out of here. I'd rather die than live than to face another day of hopelessness. That is the longing or the anxious longing, the eager longing for the revealing of somebody that has the answer. And what I do believe that Paul goes on to say, verse 23, and not only this, but we ourselves are longing because why? Of the, having the first fruits of the Spirit. 
Paul is saying, I too see some things in my life that are broken, but I know that when I have the fruit of the Spirit, he goes on to say, even we ourselves are groaning with ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. And then he goes a little bit further, verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Literally what he's saying is the world's crying out, I'm crying out, and then he goes, who's going to help us in all of this chaos and confusion, in all of this weakness, and all of this depression? It's the Spirit of God that God wants you and I to be filled with. Because if you only go halfway on this hunting trip, you're not fulfilling the call of God. In fact, if you just go to Christ for what he did on the cross and not receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you're slothful in your walk with God. You can't have the Holy Spirit unless you receive him. And that's why the Bible tells us in this world that we see, and this is important theology, when he talks about this world is crying out, he's simply saying that anything and everything of this world and all who are born in it are born under a curse. This world is under judgment. This world lives on a constant eclipse. It's always dark. Look what it says in 1 John chapter 5 and 19. It says, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. There is a world, the world is groaning because it's under the power or the slavery or the rulership or the mastership or the dictatorship of the power or the one who is evil. Judgment, the Bible says in John 20 or 12 and 31, is upon this world. Jesus made this statement. Now the ruler of this world is about to be dealt with. And then it says in Colossians, Paul says that he came, Christ, to disarm the rulers and authorities. And then he publicly made a display of them. He mocked them. How did he do that? Having triumphed over them. Through his cross. Jesus is like Billy White Shoes Johnson when he came out of the grave for those Houston Oiler fans back in the day. He made a public spectacle showing himself alive by many convincing proofs going, Satan has been disarmed. I have taken his teeth out of his mouth. And the reality is, is that yes, we do know he goes about seeking whom he may devour, but we have been given his power. Through the Holy Spirit. And when you and I understand that the Spirit now, for what reason? He is searching. and He's looking. Just like the Bible says in the book of Genesis, the very first beginning of the book of Genesis, the world, much like this, is in chaos and confusion and darkness. But God said, I'm going to speak to the situation. And he spoke and the Spirit of God began to cover, and the Bible says, and he began to recover the world that was in chaos and confusion. Why did Jesus say, now I'm going to send to you the Holy Spirit? Because you cannot have what I have given you through my cross without the executor of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is going to make it evident. That's why it's called the fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the evidence that you have God. And the evidence is that the Holy Spirit is residing in you to make evident. When he breathed on his disciples, he wanted them to receive. Notice that, receive. You've got to open your heart to receive him. In other words, there's no such thing as being force-fed the Spirit of God. So that now the mind of God, the will of God, and I want you to see whenever Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is frankly the government of God on display. So now he goes, as the kingdom is being communicated, he says, I want the kingdom or the government of God and all that is in the world to know that there has been another master, another ruler. His name is Jesus. And it is not broken. It works. Can I hear an amen? Now you have another world to live for. Because there is another world. There is another life. And if you only have this life, I can see why you were depressed. I can see why you don't have any kind of power or any kind of force to live. But Christ has come back, and Christ has come back from the dead. And he says, I have come, and I have broken the grip and the hold and the curse of sin and death. And what was bad is now good in my kingdom. 
What was once darkness is now light. Where there was defeat, there's victory. Where there was chaos and where there was hate, where there was storms, there's now order and peace and love. What everything was not working and now I, that's why he went for 33 and a half years doing what? Showing everybody that believed in him, watch how my life and watch how when you connect to me, how things come back to life. That's why the lame were walking. That's why the deaf were hearing. That's why the people who were blind were now seeing. That's why the Bible says that he'd walk into a room of a dead little girl. He'd raise her from the dead. That's why when thousands would gather around Jesus and here they were hungry and starving, he would take pieces of bread and he goes, let me show you my power. Let me show you how my kingdom to meet your every need and he breaks the bread and he breaks the fish 20,000 people are fed and all walk away full what he was saying by his 33 and a half years is what happens when you connect to me there is another world and it is not a hopeless world it is a hope-filled world that I have defeated the enemy and I rule and I reign forever that's the kingdom and what world do you want to live in Because you're going to be in one of two worlds. You want to work in one that works or you want to work in one that doesn't work? You want to work in one and live in one that has victory or one that is going to be in constant defeat and frustration? That's what Paul was trying to say to the Romans. And what he was saying to the Romans, that the eagerly the creation, longing, they're longing, they're desirous of people who can show them the way. I'm going to make a confession to you. I watched some shows and I say that loosely. I, I'll look at some shows that, uh, that I probably shouldn't look at. Um, shows like uh, Love Behind Bars, uh, My 600 Pound Life. Um, I don't watch Desperate Housewives, but it's probably in the same vein of stupidity. Okay. Um, and then having been from Louisiana, you know, 13 of the top reality shows are from Louisiana for a reason. You know that. Like, uh, you know, Who's the baby's mama? Uh, you know, stuff like that. I, I call it research, okay? I, but how many watch shows? Let me see your hand. Come on, just put it up halfway. Don't go all the way. But you watch some of that, like, that's stupid. But I feel really good about myself. Like, I feel so good. If that is what they're going through, I'm, hey, we're good, babe. We're fine. What are we complaining about? And as I'm watching some of these shows, very loosely watching, it is nothing but a picture of people who have never been subject to the kingdom of God. They've never been exposed to the kingdom. And they're in pain. They're in trouble. They're in debt. They're in bondage. They're in slavery. They're in a mess. They hate one another. They hate their kids. The kids hate them. And what he is saying is that creation, there's a longing. God has put, in fact, it says he has subjected creation to this desire that will there ever come, will there ever come a people, will there ever come a neighbor that has it together that can help actually give us some help? That's what he's saying, that the world is longing for a church. It's longing for a people, the sons and the daughters of God who are receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, which means you're receiving the intelligence of God. You're receiving the mind of God, the will of God, the Spirit of God that begins to go into all the world. See, you were not just saved and that thought about you going, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for putting me into heaven. And I'm forgiven. I'm saved. I'm delivered. I'm healed. I have a mansion in heaven to hell with the rest of them. You are now that Proverbs 12, 27. God wants you and I to be filled with the Spirit so that we could carry the meal to the rest of the world. Why are you on this planet? If God wanted you home in heaven, He would have taken you out. If He wanted you dead, if He wanted you in heaven with Him, you wouldn't be here. You are supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit to be a testimony. That there is a government, there's a world that works. There's a savior, there's a master, there's a Lord. And as long as you're on this planet, your job is to not just be about yourself saying, God, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. But Lord, breathe on me the Holy Spirit so I could take the good news of the gospel 
to this world and to those God-forsaken television shows that Pastor Joe is watching. (laughs) I've given you a little bit of theology, but it's important for you to understand. What is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? He is the executor of the Trinity. He executes. So when Jesus is on the planet, how is Jesus on the planet? Is he physically on the planet? He is not. His body is not on this planet except in the body of the church. But how are we the body of the church? We're filled with what? The Holy Spirit. See, when the disciples were saying goodbye to Jesus and they were crying, don't leave us. And he goes, it's to your advantage that I what? That I go. I have to go. You can't have me everywhere. I can only be in one place at one time until I go and send the Holy Spirit back to you. But if I remain, you're not going to have the advantage of my power, and nor am I going to have the advantage or the power to be everywhere in every one. I have to go. I have to leave. And so when he goes and ascends to heaven and the Holy Spirit is sent back, he now begins to send, and the Bible says, and the power of God is released to those who receive him. And many of us, and many are like that in the book of Acts chapter 19. Look on the screen with me. What happens when you're ignorant about the Holy Spirit? What happens when you're unlearned about the Holy Spirit? What happens when you do not know? What happens to the person of the Holy Spirit in an unintelligent congregation? He's neglected. You will always neglect what you don't know. So Paul, the apostle, talks about this in Acts 19. It says that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country, came to Ephesus, and he found some disciples. He found disciples. He found believers. He found Christ's followers. And they're sitting at the table. And he said, I want to ask you a question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no. We have never heard about this Holy Spirit. What, what are you talking about? We don't even know what you're saying. He says, let me ask you, were you baptized? So now he's correlating baptism to the Holy Spirit. And he says, into then what were you baptized? And they said, well, we were baptized into John's baptism. What was the baptism of John? We saw it this morning. What is it? It's water. The baptism of water unto repentance. It is your first step into the kingdom after believing Telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him. That is in Jesus. Now Paul says, but when he heard this, then they were baptized into the name of the Lord. And then Paul laid his hands upon them. And the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. And there were in all about 12 men there. What you find is that there was a dynamic of power released on these 12 that Paul was spending time with, but the question is we have never even realized or have ever been told about this supernatural power. If we're not careful, we are intellectually and properly, there's nothing wrong with being intellectual about the scripture. There's nothing wrong with studying to show yourself approved. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are to study. But if we do not have a supernatural connection to God and we only have God through our studies, you're going to go halfway with God. Because you're not in the realm of the supernatural. What all of a sudden they were exposed to was the realm of the supernatural. They went from the realm of water baptism. That's natural. I did a funeral in my home church of First Baptist Church in Natchez, Mississippi this past Thursday. And many of the congregants there, maybe if there were three or four hundred people there, have not seen me in 40 years. And they said, are you still growing? How many still hear that from the people at your home church? Oh, Joey, I believe you're growing. I'm 59 years old. (laughs) In fact, I'm shrinking. (laughs) And I'm not growing. You're shrinking too, old lady. And so I didn't say that thought it but anyway and many of those people have known me from the waters if you will they, they knew me from the the Sunday school Joey they knew me as Joey Sunday school 
And, and then they know, and many of them, because of the relationship that I still have with many of those people, like Jack and Peggy Benson, the reality is, is that my life from the waters of baptism and John's baptism began, but I'm going to tell you my own personal story, there was, there was the reality of the power of the Holy Spirit. And it brought another gear to my life. Why did Jesus breathe on the disciples? Because he knew that there's another gear that you need. It's the Holy Spirit. You can't fulfill. In fact, the fulfiller of the dream, the fulfiller of the will of God, the mind of God, the God thing on your life, the God purpose, the God, the God reality. The reason why you're on this planet cannot be known except by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the one and we'll give a few of those. I did not even get into what I wanted to get into in the first service. But just understand that the Holy Spirit is co-equal and, and co-substantial. And, and all of the various things, co-essential. But He is the one. The Holy Spirit is the one who lives, not Jesus. But it's the Spirit of Jesus on the planet. It's the Holy Spirit that carries Jesus. Understand that. Because when people say, i got to see Jesus. No, He's here. What you're asking for is something that, well, frankly, can get you into trouble. Be careful. When you're waiting for a manifestation of the physical body of Jesus. In fact, I think that there's probably more warnings for that kind of prayer. In fact, I am by Scripture to probably test that like no other other things should be tested than when somebody comes to me and says, God physically came, Jesus physically came into my room. Oh, really? Where do you live? I live in oatmeal outside of Marble Falls. Well, that's funny. I talked to a guy from Denver last night that said Jesus appeared to him. He's not Santa Claus in that way. He's just kind of jumping from house to house. And in fact, the reality is millions of people say that they saw God or they saw Christ physically show up and I'm not even sure why I'm saying this, but the reality is that it's not in that way or in that form. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. And He comes, and He comes knocking. It's the Holy Spirit that is knocking on the door of your heart. And He's the one that is drawing you. So you can't go to Christ except that you're drawn. And you're drawn to Christ, and then it is Christ that brings you to the Father. And all that saying that it is the kingdom of God, the Bible says in Romans, the Bible says in Romans again, 14 and 17, the kingdom of God is righteousness, it is peace, and it is joy in the Holy Spirit. Not that scripture, I'm quoting Romans, but y'all are close. <laughs> Romans says, in the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. So I want to close with what we find in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 40, it says that he, Moses, erected the court all around the tabernacle and the altar. And all of those are types of the shadows of what would come in Christ. The tabernacle, the altar, which is the cross. The veil, the Bible says, was hung for the gateway of the court. But here's the important words I want you to see. As Moses is setting up and doing what he's been called, it says, thus Moses what are those words? He finished the work. What was some of the last what was the last words of Jesus on the cross? It is finished. Now watch. Moses finished. Moses is a type of Christ. He finished the work. Christ finished the work. Verse 34, notice, then the cloud. It went from the work to the cloud. What is the cloud? Let me ask you this. Who is the cloud? It's the Spirit of God. When Christ finished His work, the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was now not able to enter the tent of the meeting. Why? Because now the cloud had settled. See, it's not about Moses. In fact, it's in the Old Testament picture in a type of, I think, even in ministry. It's not about the preacher. It's not about the communicator. How many know it's about the Holy Spirit? You don't need Joe. You need the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says now Moses is not the emphasis. It's the tent 
being filled with the glory of God. And the Bible says the cloud settled on it and the glory filled the tabernacle. And it says throughout all the journeys of Israel, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. Literally, they said they moved when the Spirit moved them. They stopped when the Spirit stopped. You know, the Bible says that if you are a son or a daughter of God, the sign is that you are led by the Spirit. The sons and the daughters of God are led by the Spirit. It also says he who does not have the Spirit is not a son or a daughter of God. Which means Israel was not moved by the flesh. They were moved by the Spirit. It says, as they went by the cloud, or they went after the cloud, it says the Lord led them in a cloud during the day, and then that night there was a fire in the sight of all of the house of Israel. It wasn't for just a few special spiritual people. How many want to be led by God night and day? Let me see your hand. We don't have time in today's world to go halfway with God. Oh, thank you, God, for your death. And I believe God would say, thank you for thanking me for my death. But I need you to realize there's more than my death. There's my resurrection power called the Holy Spirit. And he says, I want you to wait until you're filled with the Spirit. And so today, I don't need, and nor are we going to take a moment, but I do believe that we have to ask and even search in our own hearts. Lord, I don't want to live by my mind and my heart or my will or by my feelings. Because when I live by my mind and my heart and my feelings and my emotions, you know, things don't usually go well. But boy, when I listen to God, when I listen to God in the day and I listen to God at night, Maybe you're in a nighttime season. See, this is a type in a picture. It says that God led them by night. He did not leave them without a testimony in the nighttime with a fire. Maybe you're in the darkest season of your life. Can I just tell you? The Holy Spirit is here today. And you may not know where to go. But if you'll wait. If you'll trust Him. Maybe it's a daytime season for you. In fact, maybe it's the greatest season you've ever lived in. See, maybe you're not in a night, you're in a day. Life is good. Can I just tell you, that's where you need to trust God. Because I've seen many people go by the wayside. They go to the left or to the right when things go really good. How many know what I'm talking about? How many get a little sloppy in their spending when you've got a little extra in your bank account? You get a little arrogant. You get a little cocky. You get a little, if you will, neglectful of the Holy Spirit. And I think as I close today, Ultimately, what Jesus said is, I'm going to ask the Father, John 14, 16, and He is going to give you another helper. That He may be with you for... How many need some help? How many? Does, who does not need any help in this place? We all need help. You need help as a parent. You need help as a mom, a dad. You need help in your finances. If you're retired, you need help. Maybe just getting out of bed. I don't know what your help need is. But I will tell you this. God says, I've offered what you need. If God says you're going to receive a helper, that means he knows we need help. That word there is paraclete. That word there is comforter. And he goes, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. You're not by yourself. And then Jesus kicks the disciples off of his leg. And he goes into heaven. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost, they're all experiencing from that day forward the power of God. And the church explodes. Yes, God did his part. He was killed. And not only was he killed, he said, I don't want you to just go halfway. I want you to receive. I want you to taste and see that the Lord is good. With every head bowed and every eye closed today, He did not come to mess with you, to fool you, to trick you. In fact, there are many spirits in the earth, the Bible says, that will try to fool you and trick you. 
The Bible says that in the last days there will be a spirit of delusion. There is going to be in the last days, hear me, a deluding spirit. People will be tricked for a counterfeit gospel, a counterfeit spirit, a counterfeit Christ, a counterfeit move. But God says you have the Holy Spirit. If you receive Him, no man needs to teach you, for the Lord is our teacher. And just as He led Israel the Bible says safely those who listened to him and were led by that spirit, he said he led them to the promised land. Let me ask you a question. How many want to arrive safely at your journey? Let me see your hand all over this. How many want your families to be blessed as he spoke about those who were under the blessing of the power of God? In a world that has lost its brain and lost its world and its ways, I'm here to tell you we are not of this world. We are of another kingdom. And so today, you're going to have to simply do what the Bible says, receive them. Just before we go, just receive them. Lord, I do not want to live another moment in my flesh. For in my flesh, the word says, dwelleth no good thing. God, would you fill me today? Would you just ask the Lord to fill you right where you are? Fill you. And Lord, I thank you that you're so gracious and you're so kind. I thank you, the Holy Spirit, that you are here. Even though, Lord, we might not have known much about you, or we knew, like Acts 19, nothing about you. Lord, forgive us that we often neglect you. You will not be the neglected person of the Trinity. Lord, I thank you that you're the revealer and the teacher. I thank you that even right now, Father, that you are here. I really do believe in this moment, many of you just sitting under this, I think that there's a descending even now of comfort for some of you in this room. I met a beautiful lady this morning, Tina, whose sister died last night. Some of you are in a situation. Pastor Jim's dead just passed last week. Funeral last week. And in any moment, Pastor Jim is waiting on the news of his mother who will pass in the next hours. Within one week, his mom and his dad are going to be with Jesus. He needs comfort. He's prepared. They love God. I don't care how old you are, and I don't care how long you've been walking with God. You need the comfort of the Holy Spirit. How many need that comfort? How many need some comfort right now by God? He's here to help you. Father, we just thank you. that you're with us. You're here to help us. You're not the God of confusion. You're the God of grace.